What is knowledge in the age of big data? It sounds like rather a big ponderous question just now. So I'm going to start with something a bit more tangible. What do you know? Do you know what this is? I'm going to give you a clue. It's the same thing photographed from both sides. Any thoughts? It's the shin bone of a young wolf. So don't feel bad if you didn't recognize that. And if you were thinking it's a tally stick, you are also right. Because about 30,000 years ago, in a cave in what is now in the Czech Republic, in the Ice Age, somebody scratched 57 notches into this wolf bone. 57 notches in groups of five, making it therefore the oldest surviving example of digital data data you could count on your fingers. Now today, of course, we think of digital data as being something you could put into a computer in a form that a computer can store and process and give back. So it would be in binary. So 57 in binary is 111001. Uh, satisfyingly, that's just under a byte, making a byte roughly equivalent to a wolf bone. Thank you, that's a pun that only I enjoy. Uh, it also means that the one terabyte hard drive on which I back up my entire life is equivalent to a million, million wolf bones. So when people say big data, that's what they're talking about. A million, million wolf bones. So much for data. What about facts? Uh, which of these facts do you know? Which of these questions could you answer? Where is Toronto? Very good. Excellent. I'm glad you are joining in. Uh, how old is Harvard University? Older than the US, very good. You're going to get top marks in this quiz. Uh, it is indeed older than the country in which it now sits. What is the French word for werewolf? Excellent. <laughs> Do you know why you know that? Ah, because <laughs> he's French. Okay, well that's a head start. I, it's a fact that I know and never knew I knew until somebody asked me in a bar. So good, these are facts, and if you didn't know them, well, you, you do now, and, uh, and also you could easily find them out. What about this question, though? How many cats are there in the world? Now, this question, last Tuesday, just gone, I was hosting an event called Maths Inspiration, which is talks about maths for school students, and one of the speakers, Rob Easterway, was talking about estimation. And he used the example of Fermi questions where you don't know the answer and you can't really find out the exact answer, but you can make a good estimate from what you do know. And he invited the audience to contribute questions that you could use as a Fermi question. So this appeared in the question box in green ink. How many cats are there in the world? And Rob started from something he did know. He thought, well, I know how many people there are in the world. There's about 7 billion people. Uh, so if I estimate the average number of cats corresponding to each person. The, the mean number would be one, he decided, because some people don't have a cat, some people have several cats. So he estimated there are seven billion cats in the world. But before he'd even finished, a hand went up on the second row. So I said to the, the school student, yes, what's your question? And he said, I don't have a question. I have the answer. 600 million. I've just Googled it on my phone. So they do say that in the internet age, all human knowledge is just three clicks away. But where does that figure come from? Not that figure. 600 million comes off the internet and I haven't been able to find any reason why it's more convincing than the seven billion estimate that Rob came up with. The figure of three clicks away. I can tell you where that comes from. That comes from a 2012 Stanford research paper by West and Leskovich in which they got some human beings to play a game called Wikispedia to see how quickly they could get from one piece of information to another on Wikipedia. And while the human beings were doing this, Weston Leskovich calculated mathematically the shortest possible route, the minimum number of clicks that you would need to do the same route. Now, I realize not everybody spends as much time looking at graphs with as much love as I do, so let me talk you through this a little. Uh, the number of clicks, uh, along the, but the x-axis here, is a logarithmic scale, which means that the numbers get closer together as you come this way. So it starts off with one, in the middle is 10, over this side is 100. So you can see that the, the colored lines, which are the human roots, the roots the human beings found, uh, are sometimes as long as 70 or 80 clicks. Whereas the shortest possible route, the mathematically optimum route that a perfect machine would get, are never more than 10 clicks. And you can also see, I think, the, the left-hand scale is the percentage, so roughly 
how many, uh, how many, how many routes were that long, the, the frequency. So the most popular length of route is three. And this is a bit clear, actually, if I show you the, the table of results, you can see the shortest possible paths, the mode, the median are both three, and the mean is 2.9. I'm obviously using a working assumption here that you know what mode, median, and mean mean. They mean average. So you could say that, the sh that all human knowledge in the internet age is only three clicks away, on average, if you're a machine. If you're a human being, it's four clicks away. But nevertheless, it's out there. So does this mean that if you have an internet connection, you know all human knowledge? Well, no, of course not, because you only have a finite amount of time in your life to click links on the internet. And if you remember nothing else from my talk today, please take away that one fact. You only have a finite amount of time in your life to click links on the internet. If, however, you are a machine that can click links at superhuman speed, then you can amass a lot of knowledge. If you are, for example, IBM Watson, an algorithm developed to understand human language, which was let loose onto the internet to acquire masses and masses of facts and information, and then entered for the US game show Jeopardy, where it beat the two human champions at a quiz show. There it is, in the middle. Although it did get some things wrong. It did answer a category of questions, US cities. Uh, and it, it, in the category US cities, it answered one of the questions with Toronto. Which to us seems like a really basic mistake. But to IBM Watson, it can collect all this information, but it doesn't have the context that we have. It doesn't have the real world experience that we have. Sometimes data and facts are not enough. So going back to our wolf bone, for example, we can count the notches. We know there are 57 notches, but we don't know what the notches were counting. We don't know who scratched them or what for. We don't know what they mean. I like watching the TV programs where they dig up human skeletons and then they examine them forensically and tell us something about what they can tell about the person who lived. So they can say, oh, we know that this woman lived with chronic toothache for 50 years, or we know that this man was attacked with a sword, but he survived and he lived on with a scarred hand and face for the rest of his life. Uh, I like it partly because it reminds me how much medical care has come on in the last few hundred years. But it doesn't really tell us what's important about those people. It doesn't tell us that this woman with a toothache was actually Queen Elizabeth I of England. It doesn't tell us that this man who survived the sword attack was President Andrew Jackson of the United States of America. You could dig my skeleton up in 500 years and you could work out that I had a wisdom tooth removed by a surgeon who was particularly skilled by the low standards of the 21st century. But it wouldn't really tell you anything important about me or what I think or what it's like to be me. It wouldn't tell you anything about my life. You could capture my data now. You could fit me with a heart rate monitor and put that together with other data about me, like my location or what I'd just used my credit card for or even what other people were in the same location as me at that time. And you could find some associations. Even if you were a machine, you could find associations between my heart beating a little faster and where I was and who with and what I was doing. But it wouldn't actually tell you what I was thinking and feeling at that point. An algorithm couldn't tell that because it doesn't have any subjective experience. Uh, an algorithm could look at a scan of my brain. And this is a scan of my brain. Not actual size. <laughs> now an algorithm could look at that. It could categorize it as a female brain. Uh, it could possibly go through and find some disorder in my brain that I'm unaware of and that even a trained neurologist hadn't spotted yet which could be handy. But the algorithm would have no idea what that meant for me, what impact it would have on me, what choices it would face me with in my life. For that, I would need a human neurologist who might be assisted by a very clever algorithm, but who could talk to me human to human and say, well, these are the implications. Uh, I understand how you're feeling. I can empathize with you. What do you want to do? When we say we know a person, it's not the same as knowing a fact. Because 
we are thinking not only about the outside things we observe, the data we've collected on that person, what we've observed about their behavior, we're also using our subjective experience to empathize, to project ourselves and imagine what it's like to be them. In French, it's not even the same word, savoir, to know a fact, connaître, to know a person. And to be familiar with a person is perhaps a better translation. In those words, connaître, familiar, there are associations of kinship, of fellow feeling. So if we say a machine knows a person, that, that makes no sense. A machine has no subjective experience. I may once have been guilty of writing, big data knows you better than you know yourself. That was hyperbole, I had a book to sell. It's not actually true. Big data cannot know a person. So, meaning, who knows what this means? LMGTFY, no, I, I get this sometimes if I'm having a discussion on the internet and I ask somebody, uh, what, what do you mean by the age of reason? And this, they respond with this, LMGTFY. Let me Google that for you. It's sarcastic. It's not the rudest thing they could say. They could say JFGI. And if you don't know what that means, just flip and Google it. Now, this annoys me because I don't want to know what a machine thinks this means. I don't want to know what Google thinks this means. I want to know what they mean by it in this context. If you ask a machine what a word means, a machine or the internet is probably using something called word embedding where they model words in 200-dimensional vector space. Hold on to your seats, do a little demonstration. Don't worry, it's only three dimensions, so it's the same as the room we're sitting in. With uh, We've got an x-axis, uh, a y-axis, and a z-axis this way, so you won't get vertigo. Uh, but the way, uh, the way a machine would use word embedding to give you the meaning of a word is it would put a word into this mathematical space close to words that are close to it in meaning. So the word data would be up here close to words like knowledge and information. The word Toronto would be down here near other Canadian cities, Watson. Uh, and the word werewolf might be up there close to the word for werewolf in other languages, for example. They could all be close together. But if you ask a human what data means, they might give all sorts of different answers. They might say, well, it's notches scratched on a wolf bone, or it's, it's bytes or bits inside a computer, uh, or it's the Latin word for something that's given, and it's a plural word of datum. Those are the particularly pedantic people that I do work with sometimes. Uh, but it also, people will use the word in different ways. You might use the word data to close down a conversation, and, and people often do these days. They, they say, well, this is, this is the data, or these are the data, if they're that kind of person. This is, this is the evidence, that's it. There's no more discussion here. I have, I have finished the conversation by giving you something incontrovertible. I prefer to use data to open up a conversation to say, well, this is a given, but this means it's the beginning of a process of reasoning. Given that, given that there are seven billion people in the world, how many cats are there? Let's embark on a process of reasoning. Reason itself has different meanings in different contexts. Uh, there is the age of reason, which is a historical period, but why that's important, I'm sure historians are gonna argue until the end of whatever age we're in now. There's uh, without good reason, which to a lawyer means I might be able to get you compensation for losing your job, and to a philosopher means, do we really have free will? <laughs> or if you're, you're Blaise Pascal, uh, the heart has its reasons, which reason knows not. Although as the, the French person in the audience will know, of course, he wrote it in French, uh, and the words he chose were, le cœur a ses raisons que la raison ne connaît point. He used the word for knowing a person, for being familiar with, for being acquainted with. So reason is not acquainted with the reasons of the heart, which has, has a rather different meaning. And I ask myself, why did Pascal choose those particular words? What did he mean? What did he intend? What did he want me as the reader to get from that particular choice of words? Meaning is not something that is embodied in a word like the color red in these balloons. Meaning is something that goes from the speaker or the writer to the listener or the reader. So he has an intention about what I should get. But in order to choose the words for that intention, he has to project himself imaginatively into my mind. He has to use his empathy to think, I'm a subjective human being. 
How is a subjective human being reading this going to respond? What are they going to get from it? Because the writer knows that the meaning is created by the person reading. The meaning doesn't exist objectively in the words. The meaning is created in the process of reading and thinking and understanding. And that's why a machine cannot mean anything, because it has no subjective mind. In 1636, when Harvard was founded, you would have had to go to Harvard to get the benefit of all the knowledge that they had there. You'd have had to go and sit in their library to read their books. You'd have had to sit in their lecture theater to listen to their lecturers speaking. Today, you don't have to. You don't even have to get dressed. If you have an internet connection, you can download research papers from Harvard. You can sign up to a free online course. You can listen to their lecturers. You can even do quizzes to find out how much you've understood. Well, that is marvelous. It's a wonderful thing that the internet and data have opened up so much of the field of human knowledge to so many more people. But it's not a good thing if we lose track of what knowledge is. If we start to think of knowledge as a substance, like porridge that you scoop out with your fat ladle into the empty bowls of ignorance. <laughs> Come on, surely you all have a fat ladle ready to fill the empty bowls of ignorance. Knowledge is not something that exists in the bits of paper. It's not existing in the ink on the paper on the page of a book or on, in the ones and zeros inside a computer. Knowledge is a field of human activity, knowing is a verb, it's a thing that human beings do. So yes, it may be true that in the internet age, any fact on the internet can be found in four clicks or in three clicks if you're a machine, but the machine won't know what it means. The kid that Googled and found the answer of 600 million cats had completely the wrong idea. The point was never to learn how many cats there are in the world. The point was to learn how to estimate, how to build your reasoning muscle by starting with something you do know, a given, there are seven billion people in the world, and seeing if your reason can take you from that to understanding something completely new about the world. So in the age of big data, knowledge is, as it has always been, a field of human activity, and the human activity is learning and reasoning and knowing. Thank you.